Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn is the Bishop of Dallas, the South, and the Bulgarian Diocese. He is a monk of Simona Petra Monastery on Mount Athos, where he was the disciple of the great elder Emilianos. Uh, he is also a graduate of Oxford University, where he wrote his monumental doctoral dissertation on St. Dionysius the Areopagite. Archbishop Alexander is a wonderful archpastor, and he's, as you'll see, a uh, fine scholar. So without further ado, I hope you'll enjoy this episode from my interview with His Eminence, Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. Was Dionysius a Christian uh, pagan wolf in Christian sheep's clothing? That was certainly the general consensus among scholars from roughly the end of the 19th century uh, throughout uh, the first half of the 20th. Thanks in part to two German scholars whose work remains uh, important. One a Jesuit, Joseph Stiegelmeier. The other, I think, uh, I think he was Lutheran, Hugo Koch. Both published articles on the same year, 1895 which demonstrated conclusively that uh, Dionysius was familiar, the, the writer we call Dionysius, was familiar with uh, the writings of Proclus Diadocus, the next to the last of the great Neoplatonist philosophers of antiquity, on his treatise on evil, chapter four of Dionysius' Divine Names deals with that subject in part, and the section he devotes exclusively to it shows, well, he lifts some elements bodily from uh, Proclus' work. Uh, Koch's other big, and his major work, just before the turn of the century, right at the turn of the century, detailed in all the borrowings that he could find from late antique mystery religions, from late antique pagan philosophers, that would be found in the Dionysian corpus under about 15 or 20 different headings. And these materials, again, supply ample proof that the writer was familiar with this literature. That left then the question of his apparent Christianity. And the attitude of the particular scholar in question. Another Protestant scholar, a Frenchman in this, case, in this case, decided that Dionysius might have been sincere, but uh, he suffered shipwreck. That the presuppositions of, well, not just late Neoplatonism, but Platonism, full stop, uh, were fundamentally antithetical to Christianity. And that, I suppose, is the root presupposition behind most of the condemnations, which have a history, although without necessarily the Neoplatonist connection, going back at least to Martin Luther and the Reformation. For Luther, Dionysius' famous mystical theology, which the great doctor of the Reform condemned unambiguously, he was an example of what Luther called Theologia Gloriae, 
literally theology of glory, but meaning the glory of the human mind. And as Luther saw the presupposition that the human mind was capable on its own efforts of attaining to contact with God. This is opposed in Luther's own thinking to the Theologia Crucis, the theology of the cross, which holds that all good comes through Christ and the cross. That we have, in a way, nothing to offer. That faith is entirely a gift. Now, I think it'd be fair to say that Dionys the writer of the Dionysian Corpus does not embrace a full theology of the cross in the Lutheran sense. But then you won't find that among any of the fathers. All of them think that there's, the human being has something to bring to the table and is expected to bring something to the table. But a Theologia Gloria is not the case either. Um, here another um, of what uh, the Book of Job calls great darkeners of counsel shows up. And this is the Swedish bishop Anders Nigren who wrote a book called Agape and Eros back in the mid-30s, where Dionysius was a starring witness, as it were, for the, pro for the prosecution. Since Nigren's case was that Christianity and Christian leaders, Christian thinkers, had from at least the second century in Clement of Alexandria and then Origen later on, drunken far too deeply and for far too long at Plato's well, and had, and had, and had in consequence confused the uniquely biblical notion of agape, which is self-giving love, and exemplified wholly in God and his Christ, in favor of Plato's Eros, referencing the famous hymn to Eros in Plato's Symposium, where he argues that it is desire, as it were, purified of its purely carnal aspects, which needs um, the intellect up to the moment when the vision of pure beauty suddenly may manifest itself. And it is undeniable, again, that Dionysius spends quite a bit of time on Eros in that same uh, fourth chapter of the Divine Names. It is, for him, the motor of divine providence. It is what moves God, God's self, out of God's transcendence and into creation and the world. And it's created analog in us. And beneath the created Eros, there is the divine Eros at work, he holds, that propels us ultimately out of ourselves into the divine presence. As it were, uh, there are reciprocal ecstasies, yes. And he, he refers to God's movement out of, him, out of God's self as ecstatic. So likewise ours. Now, is that paganism? Well, no, not quite. No Eros, no ancient philosopher that I'm aware of speaks of the divinity, the one in Plotinus language, um, experiencing Eros. Eros appears in Plotinus as it does in Proclus. And it's a great motivating force, but it's never ascribed to the highest level of divinity because it's 
in Plato's formulation, it's in part a product of need. And of course, the one has no need. Uh, and in availing himself of this word, and if you could say, and you could say of, the, of, in, in, uh, of a substantial element in the Platonic tradition, Dionysus is again, however, following a long Christian train, Nigrin's point. For Nigrin, it's Nigrin, it was a betrayal. Um, certainly, Origen didn't think so. Uh, and Origen rightly points out that in the scripture that Nigrin references as the Nigrin references as the source for agape. Actually, scripture doesn't distinguish between the two. It can use agape about carnal love, and it can it can use uh, eros positively. So biblically, the, the the distinction doesn't really hold up. It's again in part motivated by by Nigrin's own essentially Lutheran uh, take on things. And Origen wasn't, of course, the first. He might he wasn't the first probably to use it. It seems to be in Ignatius of Antioch, as it was the early second century. My eros is crucified. An ambiguous statement, is he talking about his own? Colonel Lutz, it's, and maybe he's talking about Christ. Um, and certainly after Origen, whom all of them read, it's ubiquitous in the Fathers, not just in the, uh, as it were, the intellectuals like Gregory of Nyssa, in whom it's very prominent, or Maximus Confessor later on, after Dionysius, but in uh, a spiritual writer like the author of the Macarian homilies. It's very prominent indeed. So here he's the writer that we call, the, that, or calls himself Dionysius, is clearly availing himself of a long patristic tradition. So maybe that leads to another question. Well, to what extent is Platonism incompatible with Christianity? I think Vladimir Lossky at one point complains in his famous book, Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church, that really to, to accuse uh, uh, that really Platonism is in, in good, good part about the desire for communion with the eternal and everlasting. Certainly in its more religious forms, like in Plotinus, it's very much that. Obviously, it does not avail itself of the revelation to the Jews. But for someone like, say, Clement of Alexandria in the late second century, well, he can go so far as to call Plato, Moses for the Greeks. That is, he sets the, the pagan Greek world on a path which leads potentially to its embrace of Christ. And certainly, I think the author of the Areopagitica would have seen it, seen it in much the same in much the same light. So uh, no, he's not. Uh, he's not a Christian, uh, a pagan wolf in Christian sheep's clothing. Uh, nor does he embrace a theologia gloriae in Luther's sense, because in the last analysis, it is God's own love within us, as His creatures, which propels him, us to the encounter with Him. And finally, is the, the identity, which it must be admitted isn't often, and perhaps often enough for many, uh, ex explicitly asserted in the Dionysian corpus. Between the divine eros, between the divine activity, ad extra, and Christ, um, 
but it's there. All the names that Dionysius considers in the book Divine Names are fundamentally Christological. Hi again, hope you enjoyed this episode from my interview with His Eminence Archbishop Alexander Golitsyn. Please leave a comment below Let me know what you thought of this video. And please subscribe below uh, so you can get notified the next time an episode becomes available, which happens every Friday. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you next week.